une des raisons pour laquelle euh, on a créé cet événement, c'était cette frustration que je voyais avec tous ces éditeurs de logiciels d'il y a 20 ans qui n'évoluent pas, qui n'ont rien compris à, à ce qu'on fait aujourd'hui au Hackathon et ce que, ce que les, les, les speakers de ce matin vous ont parlé. Et par contre, il y avait des gens qui, en Slovénie, euh, avaient commencé à faire bouger les choses avec un dossier médical ouvert, euh, basé sur des API, hein, des Application Programming Interface, et que je trouvais révolutionnaire. J'ai eu l'occasion de les rencontrer et euh, aujourd'hui de les faire venir. Merci d'accueillir Thomas Gornick. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian, and thank you for inviting me. Um, so, um, the topic of my talk is the future of DHR, and um, I think one of the things uh, that many of us here realize is that while we have uh, a lot of uh, potential in the innovation, we still somehow have to bridge the gap between what we have and what we are actually building. And I think this is a big journey uh, for, for everybody involved in healthcare IT. Uh, because it's, it's a lot of times very difficult to just break with, with the past. And that's what we'll talk about today. So, um, as uh, Sebastian said, I'm, I come from Slovenia. Um, I've uh, run a, a company for, for 30 years building software in uh, different markets, the last 10 years in, in healthcare. I'm also the co-chair of the OpenEHR Foundation, which tries to define standards for clinical data management. Um, and I, I run the Slovenian European Connected Health uh, Alliance ecosystem. So when we set out uh, to do this, we were thinking about what do we need to do to uh, transform healthcare into what we would see as the ideal system. So there's four things that we came up with. And uh, the first one is very obvious. Uh, I'm sure somebody's talked about this today before which is that it has to be centered around the patient. Now, you think that's logical, but if you see the systems that are being put in place, they're almost always focused on the institution, not, about, not on the patient. The second is synchronization, because as patients go around different healthcare uh, providers, uh, data must also follow so that they can make uh, informed decision. And this brings us to data, which is uh, a lot of decisions today are not made based on the data available. Uh, because it's hard to get to, because it's not in the right format, because it's not understood. So this is something that needs to change. And of course, it has to be universally accessible. So we'll talk a little bit about how to transform uh, healthcare IT and what, uh, what methodology we could apply. The focus on data, not on applications, I think is the key message that I'm trying to, to put forward. There's a way to do this, uh, and OpenEHR defines one of these, and then we'll talk in the end uh, about some use cases where this has been done. So it's quite clear, and we wouldn't be having this, uh, this event if healthcare wasn't changing. And the change comes from many different... Um, I like this slide in, in particular because it talks about the uh, healthcare provider, the patient, and the nature of the encounter. And everywhere you move along these axes, you are basically disrupting healthcare towards automated encounters, towards virtual, uh, uh, virtually uh, located patients or virtually located clinicians. Now, this type of change brings a lot of opportunities. And actually, that's why the innovation is happening uh, and companies are being formed to take advantage of these opportunities. And there's, there's a lot of them. I don't have to go through them because I'm sure you've heard of them. But think about why does this happen? Why does disruption really happen? And think about another industry which we are very familiar with, the computing industry. So 100 years ago, we had a very personal computer called the slide rule. We, kept, we had it in our pocket. Some people are smiling, they still remember. But then what happened was because of the high cost of technology, everything moved to the center. We got mainframe computing centers, which were the only ones that had enough funding to actually make computing possible. But then as costs dropped and performance increased through the mini computer, microcomputer, we came back to the personal computer which sits in our pocket again. And the example is that healthcare is no different. So because of advances of technology, we came from 100 years ago what was a very personal physician. He came to our home, right? Then everything moved to the big hospitals. And now even the big hospitals are trying to scale down and move the patient out as soon as possible to health centers, retail clinics, and eventually even home care if 
fueled by technology which is now available to us in our pocket. So this trend is not <coughs> unique to healthcare. It actually comes from the advances in technology. But it's happening and it's affecting the solutions that we need to build to manage patient care. So there's many examples of, uh, of things in this area that I described before. Uh, retail vendors claiming they want to be number one in healthcare. Uh, Kaiser Permanente, a large institution in the US doing about half of their visits virtually. But there's also other things that are going on, a lot of mergers and acquisitions. So just uh, in the last few years, we've seen very large European vendors being bought by US vendors, uh, people like Siemens being bought by Cerner um, or uh, HP Enterprise uh, buying CSC, a lot of mergers and acquisitions. So what does this do to your infrastructure? What happens if you have one of these players and they are bought by another one and you are forced to switch? Above all, what happens to the health data that was tied to that application? So to summarize, new players, new business models, we believe that we have to switch from applications to platforms, and above all, we have to put the focus on the data, not the application. So the concept of postmodern came from a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, pain in the market because users, in this case professionals, actually are very unhappy with their systems, even the best ones. There's uh, studies of physician burnout. There's a lot of complaining about the IT systems in hospitals. And you are well aware of, of, of these issues. The patients on the other side, they can do a lot of things electronically, but except in some small countries like, like Estonia, as we saw before, they're really struggling to engage with the healthcare system electronically. So they want that to change. They want to be part of their care process. They want to contribute their own data, which they are generating using devices. They want to be engaged. And actually the health system wants them to be engaged because this improves outcomes. So the current systems have a lot of problems. Uh, it's, it's quite obvious. Interoperability comes up on top because data is now locked in the silos. But basically taking advantage of innovation that we see here at these events, how do you put that into practice in a medical facility? So if we turn to another industry, the ERP industry, the SAPs, the big systems running our corporations, actually something interesting is happening there. Uh, Gartner, the consultancy group, about three, four years ago started saying that these monolithic applications will not solve your problem. Now this is very brave because before that they were saying buy the mega suite. But what they're now saying is that these systems were built for the needs of the past. Uh, and these needs are still there, but with digitalization, we have a lot of different opportunities now. And the, the current systems are not agile enough to take advantage of that. So if you think about how we got there, we were connecting different systems together. Sometimes we still do. Uh, best of breed connected together. It was not very successful. Not a lot of data got integrated and it was costly. So we got what we call the mega suite, the one size fits all, one vendor uh, pre-integrated. And this served us well for 10, 15 years. But what is happening now, again, this is ERP. I'll talk about EHR in a moment. What's happening now is that People who have CRM and SAP have stopped using it. They actually went out and bought Salesforce or Workday, other systems, usually just the department. They didn't even talk to the IT. So this is a very new, uh, new trend, but it's really important what's happened here. So the core shrinks and innovation from different vendors happens around that core. This is already well understood in the ERP market. Now, the EHR market is a little bit different, and the big difference is the data. The data is much more complex, and it has to last much longer than in, in the ERP world. But we believe the same thing will happen in the EHR market. This is called the postmodern approach, and the key thing here is that you actually do need a core, but then you need to allow for innovation to happen around that core. And it's usually very different applications. They are cloud-based, uh, they are cheaper, they are much more useful, they are upgraded overnight. All the things that the big suites are not. 
an upgrade of an SAP is a two-year project. Okay, so I see many of you nodding. I'm sure you went through some of these. So Gartner has this idea of bimodal, and this fits very nicely, right? We have a team that runs the business, but we have a separate team with very different culture, very different ways of doing things that actually takes care of the innovation. And we actually need both. It's, it's called bimodal uh, because we cannot draw a line under what we have, uh, but we need to move forward at the same time. So the good news is that the budgets are also shifting. This is um, a study done by Gartner of, uh, of large corporations. The funding is also shifting to what they call systems of innovation because they've come to the point where they see that it's the only way to go. Uh, when you buy a big system like um, uh, Maris was telling about uh, Estonia and Epic, unfortunately that will suck all the oxygen. Finish, finish, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that was almost an insult. <laughs> so the problem is it will suck all the oxygen out of the organization and you need to keep aware that you actually need to keep a team that will handle innovation at the same time as you're putting a big system in. So if we turn to healthcare, we have core systems already. Usually we don't have one. Uh, actually, the problem with GDPR uh, or a problem that was uncovered by GDPR is that we have a lot of systems. Because of GDPR, people started counting all the systems where we hold patient data in hospitals. And the story is, is really bad. Um, we have uh, a customer in the NHS that claims to have 6,000 applications. Now an application is anything that holds patient data. It could be an access database, but there is hundreds if not thousands. So this is the problem and actually putting in the mega suite usually won't solve this problem. That's the other realization. You can put in a very big system, but these small systems still stay. So we need to find a way to solve this because with GDPR, We've counted them. Now we have to solve the problem. We have to know where each patient's data is and manage it appropriately, of course. So the postmodern approach says start moving the data out of the mega suite. Put it in an open format. Use open APIs and enable um, an app store ecosystem on top of which you can build apps and applications. Okay? So that once you do this, you can start moving some of those apps across and then you get this bimodal world that we saw in the previous slide. You have a system that runs the business but then you have an innovation platform if you'd like that actually enables through APIs, standard APIs, many different companies, small and large, to build applications. And the interesting thing here is, or the, the imperative here is that these applications must be tied to the same data. You do not want to replicate the same problem that you had before where each application keeps the data in their own format. So the fact that each application keeps data in its own format is not only in healthcare, it's in all industries. The big problem in healthcare, as I said before, is that we want to keep data for the lifetime of the patient. Now, there is no application, even the best and most expensive ones, that will last 100 years. So we will be migrating this data from one system to another every 5, 10, 15, 20 years, depending how much money we have. Okay? A lot of times it's so expensive, we just give up and we leave the data where it was. We don't make it accessible to provide insights for care. Now, the interesting thing is that we actually solve this problem for one type of data in healthcare 30 years ago. So imaging has been in a standard format for the last 30 years, the DICOM format. Documents, even if you think about something as simple as a PDF, that's a vendor neutral format. It's a format that everybody can read and write. But the structured data, where most of the value is, unfortunately is still kept in those silos. All applications, all the big vendors today keep data in their own format. And it's a business issue. That's why it's really hard to get, uh, to get across. It's not a technical issue. They actually want to keep data in a proprietary format to lock the customer to their solution. So this is what OpenEHR does. It takes the structured data out of applications, separates the two, 
because as I said before, the life cycle of data and applications in healthcare is very different. Applications will come and go and the data has to stay at least for the lifetime of the patient, if not more for research purposes and so on. So the high level architecture that we get is something like this, where we separate the different types of data from the applications through a service layer that provides open APIs for uh, different vendors to work with innovation, very uh, um, small, innovative companies. Usually they, they are not really good at storing data anyway. You know, the small companies, GDPR, all of this is very difficult for them. They're good at making the user experience, uh, providing very useful applications, dealing with process, but not really storing data. So this actually helps uh, fuel the innovation, makes it faster, but also think about this. A new application in this architecture can immediately take advantage of all the data that's already been collected. And if you ask these startups what's their biggest problem is, how do we integrate with the current data in the healthcare systems? It's very hard. And if they have to do it in a different way with each provider, it kills the momentum uh, of, a, of a startup. So it took three, four years uh, to convince Gartner that this is something that uh, really makes sense. Uh, but what they said in, the, in a recent research paper is that it's really important to persist data in a vendor neutral format, not just exchange it. Because most people, and this comes from the big vendors, is we'll keep the data in our own format and we'll exchange it when you need it. This creates a lot of issues, a lot of problems. Sometimes they don't want to share data, a lot of times they don't. But the fact that you can keep it in the vendor neutral format and offer it to application providers uh, makes a lot of sense and it actually speeds up the innovation process. So this brings us to open EHR. 10, 15 minutes? Five? Five. Five. Okay, seven. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I seven, mentioned seven. Who says more? <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned uh, Open EHR, which is um, where I'm the co-chair, and uh, uh, it's a 25-year-old organization, a foundation out of UCL in London. It came out of European projects, uh, the Good European Health Record, if somebody still remembers, in the 90s. Um, the people actually went to UCL and continued this. It was in the academic space for a long time, but last five, six years, uh, it's getting a lot of traction. Because these ideas, especially for a public health funded system, make a lot of sense. Think about how it works. You give money to different hospitals, they buy different solutions, which store data in different formats, and then you spend a lot of money putting that data together to provide a record for the patient, right? This obviously is not optimal. So I will have to skip, uh, skip uh, well, maybe just these two because they are core. So the way, uh, the way it works is that we use something called detailed clinical models, archetypes, which are very rich in data, not only the reading itself, but the context of the measurement. Because think about this, I sent you a blood pressure of 120 over 80, I don't tell you the person was under exertion on a bike, you cannot interpret this data. You don't know whether it's high or low. So you need to have the context of the measurement stored with the measurement itself. Things like exertion level, sleep status, cuff size, as much as possible stored with the data. Then you assemble these models into what we call templates, which are use case specific. So the first model was universal. Around the world, the same model can apply. It's not tied to any type of specific care provision, hospital or legislation. It's tied to the patient. The second level is use case specific, which means that everybody will have a different template, but they will store data underneath in the same archetype. The cardiologist needs more detail than the GP visit for blood pressure, for instance. But when it's stored, it's always stored in the same way, so you can query across all the use cases, even not knowing anything about the application that produced the data. So this one is, <laughs> is too tough. But suffice it to say that today we're building software very differently. We have a mix of code, whereas actually we would like to layer it out into the data layer, the process, the decisions, and on top the GUI. And actually this layer is what OpenEHR solves today, and the other two are what we are going after now, because 
if you think about how we do process, so data is obviously one thing which, which needs to be standardized, but the process is also quite interesting because today we think of process as flowcharts. But if you think about something as relatively simple as birth, there are so many exceptions that happen. You can have twins, it can be, uh, uh, she can be diabetic, uh, it can be a genetic disorder. There's many things that happen. So the flowchart, unless you make one for each case, will not really work. What we believe is that this model is much better. So think about navigation. You have a starting point and you have a finishing point. You know your goal. And the system gives you three routes based on available knowledge. But then something happens, a bad lab result, or a patient collapses. The system needs to recalculate every time a new piece of information is found. And it is exactly how the navigation systems work. And it's not uh, a coincidence that the guy running uh, this health process area at Google used to run Google Maps. So this is, these decisions, of course, will be made with AI, and they will be made by, by sometimes a person. But the analogy of the flowchart is, is very flawed for process, for clinical process. And uh, we believe that the navigation system is a much better analogy. So I'll just finish with use cases. Three? Three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah. So global presence with the exception of the US, and we can talk at lunch about why this is, uh, why this is so, but many different quite large systems. One of the largest that we are running is uh, the, the whole city of Moscow, uh, the national system in Malta, the Norwegian uh, system uh, of the four or five vendors producing software in, uh, in, uh, in Norway, and then some very, very large one, including Medtronic, which is actually doing a project here at IHU using this approach. So to summarize, the use cases for this approach are anywhere you have clinical data. So it could be an EHR system, it could be a shared care repository, it could be um, clinical decision support uh, uh, or uh, research, it could be clinical registries, uh, or it could be an ecosystem built on top of an innovation platform, anywhere you deal with clinical data. So I mentioned Moscow, uh, it's running 1,000 institutions for 12 million people uh, on one big uh, uh, data platform. And they've done fantastic stuff with visualizing how care is provided. And you have to understand where they came from. They came from basically zero IT five years ago to something that is uh, run across the city with 12 million people. I won't go through these. I will just uh, finish with... Uh, uh, the last one, which is the ecosystems uh, of innovation. And actually, I mentioned Medtronic. Uh, so here at IHU, uh, Medtronic is collecting data from all kinds of devices. And they are in different formats, even inside their own company. Blood pressure is different, whichever device you take. So they have this same problem internally. Uh, and they're starting to normalize this data into an open format. And the project for, it's called Get Ready, uh, patient engagement is actually being done here at IHU. But I will, I will let this guy, the CIO of Plymouth University Hospital, uh, in, in two minutes, tell, uh, tell the story. Ah, I will not. My name is Andy Blowfield. I'm the Director of rm &T and Chief Information Officer at Plymouth Hospital's NHS Trust. I'm responsible for the delivery of the rm &T service to the organisation um, and I'm the Programme Director for the core rm &T programme. We are a large acute hospital um, based in the southwest of England. We are a trauma centre, a major trauma centre, we're a tertiary centre and we have approximately uh, six to eight thousand devices. We had a best of breed approach since pretty much 1999. So we would buy clinical systems and we would interface, integrate them together um, using HL7. That's not largely successful. It was the only game in town pretty much in, in 1999, 2000. Uh, there were no big box solutions, um, but you, you don't pass an awful lot of clinical information um, between systems using HL7. So, we were looking for a much more 
integrated model. The core thing we're trying to achieve with, with this approach, the open standards approach, is to provide the same level of functionality that we could buy if we went to market and bought one of the big box providers, Allscript, Cerner, Epic, there's lots of them. We want to have exactly the same functionality, but we don't want to be locked into a particular provider. We want the same level of data independence and supplier independence that people are used to with things like packs. So we've changed our packs three times. We've changed it from one system to another because it's a uniform standard data repository, it's easy. They go away on Friday with one, they come in on Monday and they've got a different one. It's all about the data neutrality and that's what this open standard architecture will give us. We'll have total data independence. Innovation using the postmodern approach is, is an interesting challenge and the, the way it benefits us, we believe, is that we've, we're not starting from a greenfield position. We've got 190 clinical solutions that are already there. And we want to innovate moving forward, but we know we, we've got to start with these core 190. So a bimodal approach means we can start with what we already have and we're moving forward with innovation based on open standard and we'll gradually eat into those 190, either by working with the suppliers to move their data into, into the, the vendor neutral archive, or in, in the most brutal sense, we'll replace those systems if they can't fit that model. Um, so it really gives us the ability to make progress on a new, in a new direction using new technologies, whilst not drawing a line under what we've got already, which we just clearly couldn't do. Okay, so one more slide. It's, it's not finished, it's not finished. So, just to, to sum up, uh, it's quite obvious that healthcare is changing. Uh, we believe that today's applications cannot cope, and if you're in one of those institutions, I'm sure you'll agree. <laughs> the ERP has already made this transition to postmodern. We believe the same thing will happen with healthcare applications. The future is multi-vendor, not single vendor. And in this scenario, the vendor neutral data is a key asset. And I hope I gave you a glimpse how OpenEHR provides a platform to make this happen. So thank you. Okay.